Okay, well, we can go ahead and get started for tonight. So the MCIC series is um, combining with our Pioneer Talk sessions, and that's what we're offering you tonight. The MCIC series is an online free virtual series that is running throughout the entire month of March. This series is hosted by the Department of Campus Climate, although we've had a lot of partnership across the institution and folks that are, in kin are continuing to help make this uh, virtual conference a success. As we get started, Kaden is going to share some community standards in our chat. So because this is part of our MCIC series, we still expect folks to abide by our community standards. One thing that I would like to share at this time is to please mute your microphone when you are not speaking uh, now and throughout the engagement. This helps reduce background noise and is just respectful to our presenters. Um, all of the sessions for our MCIC series will have live closed captioning. You should see closed captioning at the bottom of your screen now in kind of a dark gray box. If you do not, please click the bottom or the button at the bottom of your screen that says CC. This could possibly also be under the more button and then click the option view subtitles and closed captioning should appear at the bottom of your screen. Please privately message Caden or myself if you're having any technical difficulties tonight. Almost all of the sessions for the MCIC series will be recorded. This is being done to make these events accessible to those who cannot attend live. And also for those outside of our institution who are not able to register or engage in live sessions for the MCIC series. Recordings will be available up to three business days after the live session occurs on our Campus Climate YouTube channel. Lastly, if you have comments, questions, or concerns about the MCIC series, please privately message us using the Zoom chat. We will also be monitoring our Campus Climate email address now and, and always, so you can reach out to us at any time. And now I would like to turn things over to Kamiko, who is going to introduce our session for tonight. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Kamiko Halfman. I'm part of the psychology department here at UW Platteville. And along with being part of the MCIC series, this talk is also part of Pioneer Talks, which is a series of talks designed to be similar to TED Talks, you know, engaging and timely. And I believe this is a very timely talk today on socio-emotional learning of students in a time of national trauma. Um, and the recent national pand pandemic and periods of racial and social injustice have impacted communities, families, individuals, including college age students. And so I'm so pleased to have the University Counseling Services and other faculty here today to discuss how learning has been impacted as a result of the national climate and traumatic events. We'll also be, they'll also be um, providing some resources for improving the living and learning environment for students at UW Platteville as well. And so with that, I'll turn it over to our speakers and I think Deirdre is going to start us off and I'm gonna go ahead and share the slides here as well. Certainly, thank you, Kimiko. We'll start with this first one. I just wanna thank the Pioneer Talk Planning Committee as well as the MCIC Planning Committee for uh, allowing us this opportunity to share information, uh, provide support, hopefully, to students and faculty uh, on this so important issue um, that we are dealing with at this time. I'd like to take a few minutes, if you want to go to the next slide, Kamiko, and introduce our presenters as well as the subject matter. First of all, Mandy Wood, one of our counselors, is going to help us to define the different types of trauma. She's going to help us understand the difference between clinically significant trauma 
and the everyday traumas that we all experience, while explaining how many of the events of the past year are part of a collective trauma that we have all experienced together. Next, Jason Arts, another one of our counselors, is going to touch on the impacts of trauma on socio-emotional learning. He's going to include a brief overview of the areas of the brain, how they are impacted by trauma, and how that can affect an individual's ability to learn and retain information. I am then going to go ahead and talk a little bit about the impact on UW Platteville students and their experiences offering some data. At that point, Jody Moen is going to take the, uh, take the helm and she is going to briefly discuss some practical ways to individually care for ourselves while working to reduce the impact of collective trauma. And finally, we're gonna offer some ways to integrate trauma-informed learning strategies. The good news is that many of the faculty on our campus are already using trauma-aware practices. The reminders and tips that Teresa Miller, our assistant director, will share are meant to address learning challenges and help reduce both instructors and students' stress levels. So I'm going to hand it off to Mandy. Okay, you can go ahead and advance the slide. So before Mandy gets started, I'm actually going to jump in and um, address our first polling question. So Kamiko, would you go ahead and explain how the viewers can uh, give us their answers to the polling question before I read it out loud? Sure. And so I'm, once I get to the next slide, which will leave a little bit more blank space, you should be able to see up at the top of your screen something that says view options, and that should allow you to annotate on the next screen. And there are some different options, like you can use text to annotate or you can use a pen to annotate. Usually the text button works the best. And so again, that view options up at the top of your screen should provide a drop down menu that allows you to annotate. Perfect, thank you. So our first question of the evening is, what are the biggest challenges you've noticed or experienced in the last year? So we're gonna advance to the next slide and feel free to start jotting down your answers. If anyone has any problems with remembering how to um, get your responses on the, on the board, please feel free to put it in the chat. Yep, Emily just said that in the chat. <laughs> Okay, online classes. Okay, so as some of the responses start coming in, I'm just gonna call them out so that they're listed on the recording as well. So we've got demotivation, access to quality mental health care during COVID, online classes, motivation to complete asynchronous learning tasks, feeling overwhelmed a lot, staying organized with, being, with school being online, anxiety through the roof, <laughs> I hear that, um, difficulty being motivated to complete anything, always feeling tired, multiple roles all at once, inability to make connections to friends, family, et cetera, Missing typical social activities. Okay, so these all seem like really common responses that we've heard um, at Counseling Services. I'm wondering if anyone would like to share any of the reactions to what people are reading on the whiteboard, um, or if anyone would like to share out loud their own experience with, with the learning challenges you've noticed over the last year. And feel free to keep writing those in as we're discussing it. Sorry, and folks just wanted a repeat of how to annotate. So it's view options at the top of your screen. It's a black kind of box, and then there should be a drop down menu. You click the option annotate. I'll put that in the chat again as well. So again, is there anyone that would like to talk about the reaction that they might be having to 
the responses of their reading or share their own experience in the past year with the challenges that they've had with learning? If so, feel free to unmute yourself or write it in the chat. You can even start your video so we can see your face if you'd like. Loss of income, I see coming in on the board. Multiple roles all at once. Okay, so I'm just giving a couple more minutes for people to enter in any responses that they have for this. Looks like, are those hearts um, kind of duplicates? Kamiko or Emily, is that what the hearts mean? Are they duplicates? Um, people can use, uh, it's called a stamp. So there's a couple different stamps that you can use on a board to kind of indicate that you love something or you're, oh. you're agreeing with something. Awesome. Well, you, I learned something new today then. <laughs> So it looks like there's a lot of um, agreeance in the, the comments that have been posted amongst the members here, the participants in the chat. So I appreciate you all taking the time to fill this in. And if no one wants to share their response, that's perfectly okay. Um, we can also come back to it later on if we need to, but um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the baton to Mandy Wood. And you can advance the slide. One second, it's not quite advancing for me. Let me, oh, I know why. Okay, so I am gonna talk a little bit about the definition and an understanding of what trauma is and the trauma that we kind of have experienced in the past year. Um, so you can go ahead and like, advance the slide. Um, so essentially I wanna define what is trauma? What is clinically significant trauma? What is the everyday trauma? And what are some of the 2020 trauma or the 2020 traumas that, that most people experience recognizing we may not have all experienced it in the same way. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about collective trauma and what collective trauma is and, and kind of how that is perpetuated through our society. Um, so you can go ahead and advance the slide. So essentially, um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration defines trauma as an event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual um, as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening that has lasting adverse effects on an individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Um, so, I had a TikTok in here previously that explained trauma as anything that happens for too long is too much or overwhelms your ability to cope. And that is the quickest, best definition of trauma I think out there. Um, the biggest things that we know that we're gonna take away from kind of this thing is that it's any event, any experience and the effects that people have from the long-term or even the short-term that someone experiences. And it's the effect of the trauma, not the trauma experienced, that determines how clinically significant their trauma reaction or their traumatic stress is. So it's not necessarily the trauma that they faced, but their reaction. Um, so when we're gonna kind of advance to the next slide and talk about that clinical trauma piece, um, so they become, when we become, have clinical trauma, um, clinical trauma is really defined by that exposure to an actual or threatened death, serious injury, sexual violence by directly experiencing the event, witnessing the event as it occurred to another, learning of the trauma as it occurred to a close family member or friend, or it repeatedly experiencing 
the trauma or extreme exposure to details of traumatic events, but it can't be through like electronic media, television or movies. Um, so when we talk about that last one, it, we're kind of thinking like first responders, um, we as therapists can kind of develop this post-traumatic stress disorder um, through constantly and chronically hearing of others' trauma. Um, so when people experience some of these really significant trauma, traumatic actions, and then have some stress from it, it can really lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, which we've all heard of, some depression, anxiety, or, mother, or other mental health concerns. Um, and it can be experienced by one event or multiple events. Um, and it's just really that people do not have the ability to cope with what has happened to them. Um, so then we're gonna kind of talk about everyday trauma is the next kind of piece of this. So awesome, thank you for doing that already. <laughs> um, so everyday trauma is kind of this emotional response to stressful events that really overwhelm our ability to cope. So this can be the small things. And one way that I like to differentiate this is if we think of like big T trauma, big T trauma is going to be those things like sexual violence. If you um, have physical body injury. So when we, it can be like car accident, sexual violence, those kind of things, little T trauma, anybody can have. So essentially like um, when I went to a training a couple of years ago and they talked about if you lose your favorite teacher as a first grader, because you moved to second grade, that can be trauma for you because it's hard to cope with. It's hard to understand. It's hard to then feel supported when you go to second grade. Um, the big things that we know from this like everyday trauma that we experience, it usually includes some high stakes decision-making. So when we think about this, we're thinking about like how, and this really came up in, 2024 is about, do I send my kids back to school? Do I celebrate my holidays with my family with the threat of becoming ill? And then also we had such racial injustice and so many protests. Do you go and protest with threat of, I could get COVID? Um, and so it's that everyday stressful decision-making. And the other thing to know about this is it might not even be the really high stakes decision. It could be the small decisions, but you feel so overwhelmed that they all feel like high stakes decision-making. Then the next part of it is that kind of rapid change in your day-to-day -day life. So a perfect example of this is almost exactly a year ago when we, didn't come back to campus. It was a rapid change for us. Um, this can also look like if you have maybe a small, is or not a small, but like a illness that requires hospitalization, your life is gonna have some rapid changes in day to day that it might be ongoing. And so that kind of like stress of my Life doesn't look the same as it did a week ago or a month ago, and I'm really kind of struggling with that. And then the next kind of piece that comes up in our everyday trauma that incurred, or that happens as part of it is like the loss of our roles and identities. Um, so this definitely came up for people in 2020 of now all of a sudden, I'm not only like working, but I might also be doing some home teaching and helping my kids at home more learn where that I wasn't doing all day before. It also really came up for some people that may have lost their jobs, that I put so much emphasis on my identity from my job and now I don't have that identity. Um, and that definite kind of change brings up that everyday trauma. So um, we all know that I always talk about everyone in this space has that kind of everyday trauma, but we may not identify it, but we've experienced it at some point in our life. Um, I, you can go to the next slide. And then the next kind of idea that I'm gonna talk about a little bit is this like collective trauma. 
So collective trauma is essentially the sum of trauma experienced by a community. And this doesn't have to be that clinically significant trauma. Um, it can be that everyday trauma that everyone in your, your community experiences. So um, Texas would be a great example of a pretty clinically significant trauma that's been collective. They had that big cold snap and then people didn't have water or power and how devastating that was. When we experience a collective and community trauma, it increases every person's risk to develop individual trauma and individual clinically significant trauma because we've overwhelmed our ability to cope with our stressors. It makes us more at risk or more distracted. So you might be more likely to get into a car accident and have some of that really high stakes, significant injury to your body and things like that. Um, and so those things can be really scary. And then the other piece of this that comes up is this idea of transgenerational trauma um, or intergenerational trauma. So it's these responses to trauma that are passed down to the next generation through our parenting, our community norms and our mores. So I think about this a lot um, as a millennial, right? So like, I was in high school when September 11th happened. I graduated college right around the time that the economy tanked. And then I now have lived through COVID. If I am having children, I might be teaching them to be fearful of some of the things that have happened or um, how can I help them like, knowing the student loan debt crisis is pretty scary for me. How do I then save a ton of money to help my kids go to school or not recommend that they take out the amount of loans I did? Um, so we know that all of these things are true and are really prevalent in 2020. With the racial injustice alone, those communities, like we think about Minneapolis, is going to have some significant changes in how their community develops and what their community new norms become and how people react in them. And so we know that that is going to be transmitted through generations. Um, and so that's the, the big things that we talk about in this idea of collective trauma. So with that, I'm going to kind of turn it over to Jody because she's going to have a new polling question for us. Thank you, Mandy. Okay, so our second polling question is to think back to a time when you were learning or in a learning environment and experienced a trauma in your life or the world. List three words that describe your experience. So like the top three words that come to your mind when you think about that. And again, if you need reminders of how to use the whiteboard, feel free to let us know. All right, the answers are rolling in. So we've got unfocused, overwhelmed, forgetful, stressed, worried, tired, overwhelming, paralyzing, frightening, unclear, scared, concerned, emotional, stressful, and worrying. Trusted adults were able to assist confused, scared, unsure, distracted, uncertainty, stress, overwhelmed, anxious, stressed. So I'm seeing a lot of stressed, <laughs> um, unworthy, imposter, sad, numb, scattered, and distracted, scared, tired, overwhelmed. Yeah. So I want you to think about this as you're responding and imagine how difficult 
it would be as a student or as someone trying to teach during this time to um, to be effective at learning or teaching, right? It makes it really, really difficult. So I'm seeing a lot of check marks on there, I, which I think means that they are agreeing with the responses, also feeling the same way. So feel free to continue to enter your responses for this question. I'm gonna ask another question out loud and hopefully someone will give us a response if you feel comfortable. Um, I'm wondering how it's feeling to everyone to see the descriptors of others' experiences listed on the board. Um, and which, if any, words really resonated with you. I know it's hard to talk about because we're, we're addressing trauma here, but again, if anyone's comfortable sharing, please feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Or again, I think Emily just said you can submit something anonymously as well. Okay. Well, I appreciate, um, oops, I think someone said something. Yeah, it looks like Natasha wrote okay. in the chat. I find it a bit reassuring that I'm not the only one who feels that way. Mm, thank you, Natasha. Yeah. So Couple good. agrees. Okay. Yeah. So it shows us that, you know, we're, a lot of us are having similar experiences. So sometimes it feels like we're really alone or isolated in these feelings, but I guess it, it looks like it's a little helpful to know that others are also experiencing that and can understand how we're feeling as we're going through these sort of experiences together. Okay, well, thank you all for your responses. That's the, the last of the whiteboard questions. <laughs> um, and I'm going to now turn it over to Jason to talk about trauma's impact on socio-emotional learning. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, so for this section, um, some of the main areas that I'm gonna try to um, touch on are First, just going over um, a little bit of, you know, general basic parts of our brain, um, highlighting some of those that, that are involved in the learning process. Um, talk about the fear and, and stress arousal process um, and, and kind of walk people through that as well. And, um, and then after that, I will pass it off to um, Deirdre and she'll kind of go into some other um, some other things as well. So if you could advance the slide, Kamiko. All right, so for this first slide, um, the brain in, in neuroscience is sometimes referred to as the triune brain. So three, we look at three um, main parts of the brain. And so one of them is the brain stem and the cerebellum, which is also referred to as the reptilian brain. The limbic system, which is our old mammalian brain, it's also referred to, and then the cerebral cortex, the, the neocortex. Um, and I will be going through and, and um, going a little bit more in depth into each of these. Um, but first, what I want to um, kind of lay the groundwork of is um, in terms of, you know, as we, as you go into and you start learning and, and, and recognizing you know, how our brains are, are set up and, and how, like the function of our brain and how they work, it really starts to, um, it really starts to kind of move things away from, you know, there being something wrong with us or that we're doing something wrong or, you know, because we're experiencing, you know, a certain emotion or, or a response that we're doing something wrong. And really, when it comes down to it, our brains are hardwired for survival and um, for self-preservation. And so um, I'll explain that a little bit more in terms of kind of the areas that, um, that influence that a little bit more. But I think sometimes, you know, just being able to know like our brains are doing 
what they're programmed to do. The problem is, is that over the years, as humans have evolved, our brains have not evolved as quickly as the world around us. So a lot of, you know, how, again, especially when it comes to the, um, the stress response and the fear response, which is very much um, happening, um, you know, in, in over the last year, especially, it's been so heightened um, that it starts to feel like, again, you know, really, when it comes down to it, our brains are doing what they're programmed to do, except the world that we live in, a lot of times that response that we're having, the signals, the, the stress response, the fear response that our brain is um, um, giving us doesn't always match up logically with you know, the, maybe a situation we're in, or, um, for example, um, you know, a lot of times students will talk about, um, just how, how much anxiety they have when they have to speak in front of a crowd. Um, and so th what happens is, is that our brains in that situation also are not good at being able to separate out what is uh, an actual threat to our safety and what is perceived to be a threat to our safety. So the way that we perceive a situation very much dictates that is our reality. So somebody that perceives, you know, um, uh, again, speaking in front of, uh, of a class as, you know, life-threatening, like this is, this is horrible, this is terrible, our brain is responding in the same, you know, almost the same way as if, you know, we were in a situation where our life was threatened or our safety was threatened. So I think that's important to know too, is that, um, you know, perception with our brain is reality, regardless of, you know, again, um, the, the situation. So I'm just kind of laying the foundation for that. So we can advance the slide. All right, so the brainstem and cerebellum area, um, the cerebellum is very much responsible for orchestrating movement. Um, so you know, moving our limbs, walking, all of that. Um, the brainstem functions as a relay station for nerve impulses between the brain and the spinal cord. So basically every nerve um, impulse will travel through the brain stem and um, before it goes to the spinal cord. And this area is very much um, important in terms of regulating our vital functions. So heartbeat, body temperature, breathing, all of those things that we don't, you know, sit around and think about, oh, I need to breathe right now. It's just, just kind of this automatic, um, uh, you know, functions that we need to stay alive. If you could switch to the next slide, please. All right, so the limbic system. <clears throat> Again, this is also referred to as the old mammalian brain. And this is the part of the brain where some of the parts, um, again, have not evolved as quickly as, as again, our world has advanced and, and just our environment. So there's multiple parts in this um, area. And so uh, this includes the hippocampus and the amygdala. Um, the hippocampus is very much involved in memory formation and, and cognition. Amygdala is, is that part of your brain that really kind of generates that, that fear response that activates our autonom autonomic um, nervous system. And um, it also serves as an interface between rational decision-making and emotion. So basically this is the part of the brain that really, you know, keeps us from just always acting on impulse. So it really kind of tries to be that interface between our, you know, again, um, our, our, the rational part of, of our brain and then the emotional part of our brain. It's also a very much in, involved in the formation of memories and cognitive and attentional processing. So as, you know, if we go to, again, bringing this back to learning, you know, very much um, a, a part of the brain that, that is involved with, um, with the learning process. Um, a couple other areas that I'll highlight as well. So the thalamus and the hypothalamus are also part of this. Um, the, the hypothalamus 
basically the main thing that that does is that it regulates our autonomic nervous system, which includes our, um, our fear response, our stress response. The thalamus is kind of the relay um, between the cortex, which I'll, which is the next one, and um, kind of sending that signal to, to the amygdala and, and so on, which I will also get into as well. So the thalamus is kind of, um, it's, it, part of it is that it's you know, also kind of looking for and scanning along with the cortex, any potential threats to our safety. Okay, move on to the next slide. All right, so the cerebral cortex, also kind of the, the top part of our brain, this is really kind of where a lot of our sensory, our motor and our association areas of the brain are. For our sensory, it's very much received sensory input. So again, what we see, what we hear, you know, kind of that five senses, um, that type thing. Uh, motor, of course, is movement. So it does a lot with, with movement. And again, this is an area that's very much involved with association, learning, decision-making and complex movements. So the cerebral cortex is also um, a part of the brain that a lot of times is only for is only found in mammals that have kind of higher level thinking. So humans, um, and so this kind of again, the cerebral cortex is is an area that that really kind of uh, starts to separate and and kind of you know we as humans. Um, we, we can learn, we can make, you know, complex decisions, all of that stuff, which is all very much a part of, of the cerebral cortex. All right, so we can go on to the next slide. All right, so now we're going to get a little bit more into that fear and stress response. Um, again, just to highlight, the amygdala is very much the control center for fear. It receives information and then it transmits motor instructions. Um, so for instance, um, just kind of walking through a basic um, stress cycle. So the thalamus will take in information and there's two different ways it can go. The thalamus can either go directly to the amygdala, which is a very quick process. So it's taking, you know, the stimulus or, or whatever is the threat and it's sending it directly to the amygdala, which then activates um, everything pretty quickly. Um, or the thalamus can go to the cortex first, which is again, that part of the brain that that's kind of, you know, more for reasoning, decision-making, more that, you know, a, a lot of the rational process, and then it goes to the amygdala. So that last one is kind of the one where, okay, we perceive a threat, but then we're able to, it's able to go to the cortex, which again helps, uh, that helps us kind of more with problem solving in the moment. It allows us to, to really kind of plan and, and really kind of figure out the situation. And then it goes to the amygdala, um, again, depending on what the threat is. Um, so the, the, the difficulty comes in is when it's the thalamus to the amygdala connection, the very quick connection. And that's the one that um, a lot of times, you know, when we experience, you know, maybe a, a significant anxiety or, or a panic attack or, or something, that's really kind of the, the part that is being activated at the time, very much that fear response. And it's very much um, tied into, again, that kind of mammalian part of our brain, the part of our brain that's really hardwired for us to survive. And that hasn't, you know, again, evolved as quickly as um, the environment. So um, again, a lot of times what happens then is that once the amygdala is activated, it sends a signal to the hypothalamus, which then um, engages our autonomic nervous system, basically getting our body ready to, to either do the, uh, uh, the fight or flight. Um, and then the hippocampus, which again is involved with memory and cognition, that goes offline. And the reason for that is because if we are in a life-threatening situation, you know, if, uh, you know, if we don't survive that, there's no point in us having, you know, any, you know, memory of the situation. It's not 
it's not something that is important for us in that moment, especially if it's that, you know, that, that kind of survival moment. And then, um, and then it just kind of continues to cycle with the amygdala. And then once the threat is over um, and, and kind of the autonomic nervous system calms down, the hippocampus then comes back online and it takes, and it starts to take the memory, it starts to take the information of that situation, it starts to relay it to the cortex. And what happens when it goes to the cortex at that point is when we're forming kind of more of those long-term memories, we're, we're kind of, um, you know, being able to assess the situation and start to really kind of plan like, okay, if this happens again, you know, what am I gonna do type of thing? Um, very much helps for future planning, helps for learning. Um, so um, in this process, cortisol, one of uh, the stress hormones, as well as adrenaline are released. And, and again, these hormones are, are, are important for us in a survival situation because it gets our body ready to, to um, either fight or flight um, again. Um, again, it's it, when it's modu it helps modulate stress reactions, which is very helpful. However, especially with cortisol, if there's an excess of it, so, you know, if we're in a constant stressful state and the cortisol is continuously being um, released into our, our nervous system, it starts to lead to atrophy, which again is, um, atrophy is shrinking of the hippocampus. And again, you know, just a reminder, the hippocampus is very much um, a part of memory and cognition. Um, so what I went through was kind of a complete cycle in terms of, okay, there's a threat, there's a fear response, and there's um, kind of the, uh, the body coming back to, to kind of that, that homeostasis at the end. What happens then, um, I think go to the next slide. So part of, part of what we run into is there's, an, in addition to the fight and flight response, there's also a freeze response. And um, what happens is, is that mammals, you know, humans being mammals, we are not built to, to kind of handle a freeze response very well in terms of, again, that stress response. Um, so, so what happens is with the freeze response, we're in a situation and you know, all, of those, all of those hormones are, are going through us. In, in a typical situation, if there's a fight or flight, um, you'll, you'll expend energy. You'll either run away from the situation or you'll defend yourself. And so when you expend that energy in the fight or flight um, situation, it really kind of allows those, those hormones, all of that, you know, um, uh, the autonomic nervous system arousal, it expends that energy. And, and again, and we kind of get back to, okay, our body starts to, to kind of slow down. What happens with the freeze response is, is that um, it becomes an incomplete cycle. And what happens, you know, in terms of what, what can happen with an incomplete stress arousal cycle is, it's similar to an automobile with both the accelerator and brakes being floored at the same time. So if you think about it, it's like, there's just all of this, this energy and, and it's not being expended. And so you can think, you know, again, in terms of, um, you know, kind of learning and, um, and some of the areas of the brain that, that are impacted, the, are, are kind of, with us being more sedentary than, than we used to be, where we're not, you know, we're not always um, active, especially during the COVID where, you know, we've had to stay inside sometimes, we've had to be isolated. You know, when we're stuck in that freeze response, again, all of the things that are impacting us in our environment, all of those threats that we're perceiving are activating our nervous system. They're activating that fear response. All of those hormones are coming into our body getting us ready to, to do what, you know, we're supposed to, because again, we're, we're built to, to um, survive. And, and um, what happens is, again, all of those stress hormones start to shrink some of the areas that, um, that deal with memory and cognition. And it also, um, over time, it also really impacts our ability to 
to kind of react to stress in a, in a helpful way, if that makes sense too. Um, and that's really um, in terms of the incomplete stress um, arousal cycle, over time, that's eventually what really kind of leads to, to some of what we talked about with the PTSD. Um, and uh, let me see. And so kind of bringing it back full circle in terms of looking at this, this past year with you know, a lot of, of things happening at once, especially the racial trauma that uh, a lot of people have experienced along with COVID. And so depending on, you know, for, for, our, for our BIPOC students, our students of color with the racial trauma, you know, the, this has been something that, that a lot of, a lot of um, those students have been dealing with for, for a long time. So um, it's not just something that's, that's new in, in 2020, but it's kind of like, you know, it, it really hit us in the face. So, um, we, we really couldn't ignore it. Um, and so again, when, when we're kind of in that constant, um, you know, experience of trauma where, or, or where there's, there's a threat to, to our safety, there's a threat to our life, that's gonna keep that, um, again, that fear response going and basically, you know, learning and, and being able to do any of that other stuff really kind of, um, takes a second place in terms of just our, our preservation um, of, of our safety. And then COVID too, you know, again, with, with the constant fear that people are experiencing in terms of um, how, you know, am I going to get sick? You know, again, with COVID, we've really seen the, the, the health disparities, you know, with, um, again, with people of color, BIPOC, and, and all of that, again, you know, when, when our, when our safety is threatened, when, when our, um, when our life feels threatened in, in any way, and we're constantly in that, you know, it's going to, it's going to eventually lead to, to again, kind of what we've been experiencing. So, um, I think that is it for my section. So I will go ahead and, um, pass it on to, to the next section. Thanks, Jason. Uh, in the interest of time, my next few slides yeah. are uh, data-driven. And so what I'd like to be able to do is just make a few key points as I go through those so that we can get to the last two sections as well. Um, first of all, I think it's a collective awareness uh, that we all have in the sense that um, COVID-19 has disproportionately affected the mental health of Americans um, and specifically those age 18 to 24. For college age students, the most severe impact has been psychological. You can transition there. So in this first slide, um, I would just want to point out that um, national data supports what I've just referenced. Our institutional data is also supporting that. We know that this pandemic has impacted students functioning academically, socially, and emotionally, um, and hit some groups worse than others. So when we are looking at different studies, what we are seeing, of course, is that when you dig deeper into information um, and the data that is out there, we're finding that um, it, it, it helps to increase our awareness of how racial trauma and the pandemic is impacting students of color. Um, we, we have had several discussions on the whole thing with suicide and suicide rates. What we know is that suicidal ideation, which means people having thoughts about suicide, that has increased. And the CDC has reported it almost a 50% increase. We don't have very good information yet about the suicide um, completion rate during this COVID time, but some information that's coming out right now, which is really relevant to our community, I think, our campus community, is the rise in uh, completed suicide among Black youth. You can go ahead and transition. So this is the Center for College um, Mental Health uh, um, is out of Penn State University. It's a 
a program that we are closely connected with. We use their information for national benchmarking in our department and also contribute some information to them as well in terms of what our students are experiencing. So this really just simplifies for us um, the, the fact that the people who are seeking services during COVID, this is really what they were um, seeking that for. And it, as you can tell, mental health, obviously, uh, the number one identified one. But if you look at motivation, focus, academic distress, those are two indicators that speak directly to their experience here on campus. And of course, the fact that um, you know, 85% were impacted by one and 81% and had multiple impacts. Um, students are sharing how overwhelmed they are. Um, the social and economic consequences of this pandemic, um, coupled with the uncertainty of their future, especially for seniors, um, has had a tremendous impact on their mental health. So, you know. One thing, and, and we were just in a conference for these last two days, something someone mentioned was the fact that, you know, our students, we want them to prioritize their academics, but at this time of national crisis, we also need them to prioritize themselves. You can go ahead and switch. So in, in a sense of, um, you know, regardless of kind of the pandemic, right? Um, we have to acknowledge and respond to the national trauma that our students are experiencing, um, whether they have experienced it personally or whether they have witnessed it. Um, and what we're learning is that witnessing it um, can have as much of an impact on an individual's emotional well-being. Um, so something to think about from that perspective. Um, the other thing is that we have when we're thinking about African-American and Latinx communities, um, the losses associated in those communities are, are significantly challenging. Um, these are students who've had to worry because of the health disparity between their families um, it, compared to other uh, demographic groups. And you can go to the next one. So at the same time that we're talking about um, what's going on for our students. I also wanted to make sure and emphasize that, that we are very aware of faculty impact, um, that our faculty are experiencing the same sense of overwhelm. They are recognizing they're working harder than they've ever worked before um, in the sense of just trying to keep things together for themselves, probably their families and their students, but also the reality that, um, you know, institutions should be recognizing that student mental health is very important, but so is faculty and staff mental health. I am going to go ahead and pass it on to Jody then. Thank you, Deirdre. Okay, so I'm Jody, and I'm an associate counselor at Counseling Services. Um, and I'm just going to be talking to you about some ways to work on being your best and I'll elaborate as we move forward. So after we've spent some time learning about trauma and its impact on socio-emotional learning and the student experience at uw Platteville, you may be wondering to yourself, well, how can I help and how do I address trauma's impact in my own life? Um, we know that educators are reporting higher levels of distress and concern in response to the significant changes brought about by the pandemic and some of the other traumas we've experienced this year. Um, so it's important to acknowledge that this has created heightened levels of anxiety, stress, and fear in our community at large, which we know then also impacts our own mental health in a variety of ways. Um, the rapid transition to an online teaching environment has impacted professors and students, physical, emotional, and social well-being. Um, it's helpful to acknowledge that the complexity and uncertainty of the current situation um, has been trying and also to understand that it's normal to feel overwhelmed, anxious, fearful, stressed, um, and other negative emotions as we transition to new ways of teaching, leading, and learning. In times of uncertainty, it's normal and very natural for people to respond in unique ways. It can be helpful to focus on the aspects of our lives that we can control, like caring for our physical health, safety, and emotional well-being. 
our intention in addressing faculty and staff about this topic specifically is um, that we understand their role as an importance in being the main point of contact for students to get this information, which we know um, they are one of our top priorities here, um, as well as possibly wanting and needing to care for your own mental health. So some of the best ways to work on taking care of yourself are by working on self-awareness and self-care. You can go ahead and advance the slide. So just a really brief um, short definition about self-awareness. Um, it's the ability to see yourself clearly and objectively through self-reflection. It's an individual's ability basically to appreciate the strengths and weaknesses of our own character. Um, enhancing self-awareness can help to make you more aware of how you're feeling mentally. And I'll just let you go ahead and read um, the rest of the bullet points below on the screen. But essentially, um, overall, it can just make us more proactive, boost our self-acceptance, and encourage positive self-development. You can go ahead and advance the slide again. So what can you do? Um, we've looked at how broadly addressing self-awareness can help us to improve our overall well-being. But sometimes it can be really difficult figuring out how to start doing that. So self-care is a great place to begin. Self-care is literally anything that you can do to take care of yourself so that you can stay physically, mentally, and emotionally well. There are many ways to reduce the effects of collective trauma and deepen your own self-awareness while caring for yourself. Below are just some suggestions that I have for the group. So um, the first is consider uh, limiting your time being exposed to media reports. We know that psychological distress can result from repeated media exposure to the pandemic and other national traumas. Uh, consider choosing one or two trusted sources like the CDC or the World Health Organization uh, to help yourself stay up to date on critical information. Um, Consider limiting repetitious exposure to media stories and social media, and really be wary of reports on social media whose reliability can't be ensured. Um, we know that it's really important to stay connected, so we want to encourage creating and maintaining social supports, um, especially spending time connecting with yourself daily. Also consider linking up with friends and family, volunteering possibly if you can do that safely, or joining an online support group. Next, um, we know that it's really normal for people to experience a variety of emotions in response to a crisis such as COVID-19. Um, some of the emotions experienced might include grief, anxiety, fear, stress. Many of us will feel grief for the way that our lives used to be, and I think that was already mentioned by someone in this presentation, um, or even anxiety linked to how your family is doing, um, your health or financial worries. So we would encourage you to utilize behavioral health resources. And some examples of that would be therapy. So find yourself a good therapist to connect with. If you find someone that you don't connect with, try again, because <laughs> we're out there. Um, consider using, if you're a faculty or staff member, consider using our employee assistance program. And I'll go more into that on the next slide. And also um, maybe apps that, since we're in such a digital era, you could download some apps on your phone or your tablet. Um, and one that I will plug for the UW system is Silver Cloud, and it's free to all of us who have um, UW system usernames and passwords. So anyway, that's, that's some ideas for the behavioral health resources. Next, consider spending some time outside. So you could find places that you find most pleasing for yourself, um, which helps to really boost your mental health um, and gets you engaged in some you know, natural environment. While you're out there, you could exercise. <laughs> so that takes us to the next point. We know that it's important to build regular movement breaks into our day. So consider taking the time to step away from your computer and move your body in ways that you can, in ways that feel comfortable and safe to you. Um, we would also consider taking the time to notice and name and accept all of our emotions, which we would consider being meditation or mindfulness. Um, mindfulness is a helpful approach to use because it um, allows us to be aware of our thoughts, emotions, and sensations without really being um, resistant or judging them. A last consideration would be to journal some of your thoughts. So it allows you to help identify, clarify, and work to accept your thoughts and feelings. 
It helps you to discover what you want, what you value, what works or doesn't work for you, and we know that all of those things are equally important. Whether you like to write free-flowing entries, a bullet journal, or poems, consider just writing down your thoughts and feelings to help you become more aware and intentional. You can go ahead and advance the slide again. Thank you. So this is just a, a quick um, screen grab that we got from the Human Resources SharePoint page. So I, I included this on the slide just to give you an opportunity for faculty and staff to take a photo of this if you'd like to have it really handy. Um, just take notice that we did change um, companies that we were working with for our employee assistance program. So now we're working with Kepro. And um, again, just put it up there to take a photo of it if you'd like. If you don't want to take a photo of it, it is available on the Human Resources SharePoint page. Go ahead and advance the slide. And then this last slide is something that I just included for thought. So I'm gonna hold space about 45 seconds just to give us a moment to be mindful. Um, I'd like you to spend just a couple seconds thinking about some specific ways you will continue to survive and take good care of yourself, your family, and your community during this national trauma. So I'm just gonna stop for just a moment and hold space for you to think about the ways that you'll continue to survive and take care of yourself. Okay, so I'm not sure how many seconds that is, but I'm a therapist, so I can hold space forever. <laughs> but I'm going to get get back into. Um, I want you to consider if this wasn't a, something that you felt you could do right now, or you didn't have the energy to do. That's okay. Um, but I'd like you to consider if you are a leader on campus, maybe adding this as an agenda item to prioritize for your staff during a meeting um to allow space to think and talk about self-care as a priority and for the students in this meeting or in this room with us consider holding a space for processing this with your friends your family or um, other peers to continue to check in with one another and see how people are doing mentally um, and that is it for me i really appreciate all of your time and attention and i'm going to pass it on to Teresa. and this is this will be the last section that we've got one quick thing before Teresa starts. I know sure. we're at six o'clock, which is when we plan to go to. I, I've heard that this is probably one of the most interesting sections. So I'm going to let Teresa continue, but I do want to acknowledge that we are around six o'clock. And so um, I understand if a few folks might have plans that they needed to head out for, um, but I encourage you to stick around if you are able to. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share with everyone some of these objective and simple ways to really show um, your compassion. We know that you have already been helping students in a lot of positive ways manage their stress and continue to grow throughout something that a year ago we had no idea um, how far we'd become teaching and doing our online practices for all of our jobs. And so these are just meant to be reminders and tips. And there's a lot of resources that we have available if you have information. Um, so if you go to the next slide, what we're talking about was really incorporating trauma awareness, right? And so the main few areas we'll talk about for trauma awareness, the first one I want to cover is really safety. And safety means that there's efforts to create an atmosphere of respect and acceptance and the feeling that everyone in the group, in the class, is safe to learn and make mistakes. There's some examples listed on here of things you can do, such as normalizing a discussion about mental health or about stress, knowing that it's all right to ask for help and having that information out there. 
and to uh, acknowledge that if you're struggling, there's options out there on campus. Building in that safety to where students, um, it is presented in front of them, right? Con especially important at a time when they're all noticing that they're overwhelmed, they're uncertain. Um, we'll go into the next slide from here. The second area for trauma-informed practices that you can incorporate online is one of trust. Trust and transparency really can be enhanced by making those expectations really clear. Students continually tell us that it's really hard to stay calm and to know what to do when, especially for our first generation students or working class students and BIPOC students they may be less likely to ask for accommodations. We know that because of their history and because of their skills and their background, middle-class students are more likely to advocate for themselves, to ask for accommodations, and to believe that they deserve um, that relationship with their professors. And so by us being clear about how we are going to implement um, when we are reachable, what hours will respond to, uh, how students can expect to get a hold of us, can be really good for students who are negotiating how to find that identity in a virtual world of communicating with their professors. The next slide would be great. Um, another area for trauma-informed care is really what we're talking about is support and connection, right? Just by the nature of logging into this discussion tonight, you have already shown that taking that moment, even if it's virtually and not in the same room, but taking a moment to be with other people and really hear their stories gives you a pulse on the room. And so that can be a helpful thing to implement at the beginning of class with a kind of um, informal chat time. It can help to normalize and kind of recreate um, that environment when students and professors would be sitting, waiting for a class to start and bouncing ideas off of each other. A lot of those ordinary moments of everyday contact between students and professors are something that students really indicate that they're missing out on. Um, so communicating to your learners that you would care about them as humans first and learners second really is important in how you're expressing that empathy. The next slide would be great. Um, the last real main thing to consider uh, is we definitely all, even as we sit here after you know an hour, realize that it can be exhausting with Zoom fatigue, um, right? And so incorporating some choice and collaboration while we're um, kind of all figuring out how do we deal with this new stress on our own. Um, choice and collaboration and treating students with some of those choices can be really helpful to build in opportunities where all class members get to provide some input or provide some shared power in decision making. I think it's okay to brainstorm with students what times those might be, right? What are the times when it's okay to have your camera view off versus what are the couple occasions when it's more likely best for it to be on, um, right? Knowing that it's also okay to do less right now. That actually as a professor, if you choose and allow students some of these choices and how to redo an assignment or to cut the lowest score, actually, you know, that compassion and showing them that you have that flexibility and that choice and collaboration with them um, can show that, look, you believe that they are doing enough and they're worth it with how they've shown up in the class. And I think that those can be some easier ways as we interact in this new virtual way to really incorporate that we are prioritizing that relationship, prioritizing understanding that in order for the brain to be in that zone of optimal learning, um, we have to experience safety. We have to experience connection, and we have to believe that there's a purpose to what we're doing. 
So we'll go to the next slide. We do have a little breakout time for anyone who still has a few minutes to be able to join with us. We really do want to keep it um, brief, but maybe get a chance just to hear from everyone. What is it that you've already been doing? What has been working? What maybe has been challenging? So we can bounce ideas off each other and talk about how do we keep this conversation going? And I think actually for the sake of time, since we are a little bit over, we might pause here and maybe if people want to just discuss this in the larger room, um, since I know a couple of people have had to log off after six, um, I'm happy to stick around, but I do wanna respect everyone's time and I wanna make sure we take a moment to thank all of you uh, for your time and for this presentation. I learned so much um, and really appreciate it. And so again, if people do want to stick around and, uh, and continue this discussion, I will stick around with whoever is able. Otherwise, I do want to respect folks' time here um, as we are a little bit over time. So Kamiko, I'd, I'd love to um, wrap up from our perspective in terms of, of this presentation. Um, we're hoping that those that have been present tonight can, can continue to focus on kindness um, for both themselves and for the other people around them. Um, we encourage people on campus to not necessarily rely on their own narrative, but to ask questions and learn more about those that they're connecting with. Um, um, also, we want people to work at validating others' experiences and definitely normalize help-seeking behaviors. And hopefully what we will see um, as a collective effort of all of our work is that um, the well-being of, of students uh, and their emotional health will be a priority on our campus. So thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was amazing. If anybody does have a question here at the end, um, I invite you to ask or contribute to discussion, type into the chat. Um, otherwise, thank you all for your attendance and thank you all for this presentation. This was, I think, very needed on our campus. Y'all did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Are there Thank any you. questions? I see a couple of people who aren't part of our. All right. Well, if uh, there, oh, go ahead, Jason. All right. Uh, hello. I have a question. Um, earlier in it, uh, we talked about um, creating space and um, having that time, but you brought up a really good point of if you don't have the energy to create that space, like in that moment. So what are some recommendations to have the energy to create a space in the first place for thoughtful thinking? That's a really great, great question. Um, I know that it can be hard to kind of conjure up motivation or energy to do something when you feel like you don't have it. Um, I would say to prioritize some of the most basic needs before um, spending time doing any um, existential thinking or anything like that. So if you feel like you don't have the energy for it now, I guess take care of yourself in the ways that you can. And when you feel like you do have the energy, maybe circle back to it because um, you wouldn't want to push yourself to a place where you're doing worse mentally because you're expending energy that you don't have to this. So like I said, I think really just taking care of yourself in the ways that you can. And when you have time or energy to do it, then maybe say, all right, I could journal this now, or I could, I could spend some time talking with folks about it. If anyone else has any other better thoughts or ideas, go ahead. But I guess um, my only thought would be, I know um, so, so a lot of mine were talking about those intervention and the little ways to do it. And I think a lot of times the thought is that we need to have a lot of time to kind of create this space for ourselves. Um, but honestly, I think that if we can uh, work on some of that self-awareness like Jody was talking about, that oftentimes there are the, a lot of simple practices to incorporate 
um, right where we are able to kind of help train the brain and pull back um, if we are kind of in that stress cycle through it. And so um, that's a lot of what as counseling office, I think we help people um, develop and work on what are those specific kind of grounding skills. But I think, you know, just whatever it can be that kind of in the moment helps you to center and focus that, um, of course, um, all those problems need to be solved. But in order for you to address them, like, uh, the first thing first is to get your relationship to yourself back in order. So um, a lot of those grounding skills, I think, are a key thing to really focus on. And they don't have to be big. They can be taking uh, three breaths um, and releasing kind of the tension in your face. Thank you. All right, I think if there are no more questions, we can wrap it up. Thank you all so much again. And thank you to those of you who stuck around this entire time. Mm -hmm. um, it was so great to hear from all of you. And I really appreciate the participation that we had tonight. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good job, everybody.